Yes, we hope you'll come and be with us anytime that you possibly can. I do have just a few announcements that I need to make before we enter into our worship. Brother David Lovell is going to be leading our singing, and we're going to have them songs on the screen. But if you need to use a book, number 732 will be the song that he will uh, start off with. Uh, <clears throat> the Georgia School of Preaching here on this campus uh, is going to start a class this coming Monday night. And it is a subject on is World Religions. And Brother Billy Simmons is going to be teaching that class, uh, still taking applications. And uh, if you've been thinking about expanding your knowledge and, and understanding of world religions, it would be a great class for you to take. Also, remind you, our members, that uh, we are in an elder selection process. And uh, that will uh, be completed, I think, with uh, this, even, or this Sunday, even, coming Sunday evening. And uh, so we want to invite you to go by and pick up. There, there are some slips of paper out there in the back with some passages of Scripture that you might go home and read. And you might be thinking about someone here in the congregation, some man that uh, is fulfilling those kinds of uh, directives in his life already that you think would be a good uh, helper to shepherd this congregation and write his name down, give them to the elders, and then again we encourage you to pray for them and uh, that effort uh, that they're going to be going through the next few weeks and selecting men who will really uh, be able to fulfill that responsibility along with the ones, the elders that we have. Um, I was re I received this note, Sister uh, Joyce Sanders' great grandson Hayden Kennan age 19. He was in, apparently in, an, in a motorcycle accident on Sunday afternoon on his way from, um, uh, I think, up through North Georgia. And uh, he is at um, North Georgia Medical Center, and he is awaiting to have surgery. And so we want to be mindful of Joyce's grandson. I don't, well, Hayden Kenyon, again, Kenan, rather, is his name. Again, we're so thankful to have uh, brother and sister uh, Dan and Diane Winkler with us from Huntington, Tennessee. Brother Dan has just done an outstanding job for us this week, and we thoroughly enjoyed the lesson. He just has such a, an amazing way to get down right into the text and uh, even some of the deeper texts of the scriptures and to pull them out in such a uh, a simple and understandable way, and I think we're all in for a great treat tonight in our study, and so we, again, we're thankful that they're here, and at the proper time, he is going to be presenting a lesson on the cost paid of the lost, so we look forward to hearing that at that time. Let's enter into our service. Just one more real quick announcement. Brother Bob asked me to to mention it's very hard to get away from these things. I've learned that more and more over the past few months, but if you have not already done so, just double check and make sure that's on silence so that we can focus our minds and our attention on God's Word tonight. We're going to sing number 732, and let's all stand together as we sing, please. We praise thee, O God. Verses 1, 3, and 5. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of
we heard from Brother Dan that we'll be focusing on the cross tonight and the sacrifice made for us. We'll see number 742, and I hope that you'll find that our songs tonight will focus our minds on that cruel cross of Calvary. 742, when I survey the wondrous cross. When I survey so thankful for that. Father, we're thankful for the time that we can be together here as a the body of Christ, family of God, that we can join together as we study your word and think about the horrible, horrible th tragedy that Jesus had to endure for the forgiveness of our sins. We pray for Brother Winkler. We pray that you might give him wisdom and guidance and assistance as he preaches tonight for the message of your word. Father, we're so thankful for the opportunity to listen to that. We're mindful of those that are suffering tonight. We're mindful of those who've lost loved ones. We're mindful of those who are struggling with different kinds of traumas and tragedies in life. We pray your blessings to be with them. Open all of our hearts that we might be able to receive the word with good faith. Help us, Father, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
The next song is in the supplement, number 217. How deep the Father's love. 217, please. We'll sing all three verses. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that He should give His only Son to make a wretched treasure.
the Romans had just crucified another Jew guilty of treason. Or so they thought. The Jews had just ridded themselves of another false messiah. Or so they thought. His mother Jesus and his best friend John had just said their last goodbyes. Or so they thought. But what did Jesus think? In the darkest moments, in the heaviest shadows life could ever extend to one human individual, what went through his mind? I believe we have some indicators. As we think of what Jesus said at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Matthew chapter 27 tells us he cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. And the Holy Spirit doesn't leave us in the... In the Shadows as to what that Aramaic terminology means. He goes on to say, That is, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now a diligent student of the Bible will recognize these words of Jesus to actually be a citation of Scripture. Psalms 22, verse 1. Tonight I'm going to ask you to open up your Bibles or turn in your iOS device, whatever it might be, to Psalms 22. Psalms 22, verse 1 and following. And in doing so, we're going to do two things. First of all, we are going to try to step into the heart of David. And see what David was experiencing on the occasion in which he penned the words of Psalms 22. But as we let the psalm unfold before us, we will at the same time, in the second place, try to see what might have been going through our Lord's mind. With this psalm coming up flowing over his heart. Having seen what David might have been thinking and what the Lord might have been thinking as he hangs upon the cross, we will then make application of what our Lord experienced to your life and mine as we draw things to a close. For the bulk of our study, we turn to Psalms 22 to see what was going through David's mind on the occasion that brought him a great deal of sadness and extrapolate from that to what Jesus might have been experiencing or thinking as he hung from the cross. I would suggest that as we read Psalms 22, we read the words of a man who felt abandoned, the words of a man who felt ashamed, the words of a man who felt alone, And the words of a man who felt afflicted. Yes, I believe David felt that way. But I would suggest there is reason to believe that Jesus felt that way as well. Hanging on the cross. And thus far, far more was involved in a citation of that scripture than just a quotation of scripture. I would suggest to you, first of all, from Psalms 22, that as David penned this psalm by divine inspiration, he felt like a man who truly was abandoned. Look at verses 1 and 2 carefully. Watch, if you would, 
three questions are asked. Two are asked outright, and the third one is implied. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Question number one. Of interest to me, as the psalm begins, it just begins with an abrupt outburst. A question. There is no introductory observation. There are no precursor thoughts. It is as if this individual has a heart that explodes into this abrupt expression. This question, my God, my God, why? Ladies and gentlemen, you are not the first to ask that question. Why is this happening to me? Why is all of this happening to us? Our Lord quoted a passage from the monarch of Israel who asked that same question. David, in penning Psalms 22, felt abandoned by his God. Question number two. Verse 1 continues, Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? Read that carefully. David did not ask, Why are you so far away from me? Transcendent. No. David wrote, Why are you so far from helping me? Indifferent. Here he is a man who feels as though he's abandoned by God and he feels as though God is totally indifferent to his plight. And he wants to know why. Question number three is implied. Verse two. Oh my God, I cry in the daytime. But you do not hear. And in the night season, and am not silent. I want you to see the progression of David's thoughts with these two questions that he asked and the third one that's implied. In the first question, he's asking more or less, God, are you there? And he says it twice, my God. Hey! My God, why have you forsaken me? Are you there? The second question implies the idea of God, do you care? Why aren't you helping me? Why aren't you listening to me? And the third question actually implies God, are you there? God, do you care? Then why won't you react to my prayer? Here is a man that feels abandoned by his God. Pause. This is the psalm Jesus quoted just prior to his death. He has spent six hours hanging on the cross. He has broken his silence a few times before. But now he quotes from Psalms 22 verse 1. And I can't help but ask. I cannot help but ask. Did Jesus feel abandoned by his God. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, ekatalipo. Why hast thou ekatalipo me forsaken? Ekatalipo. Wait a minute now. 
This word translated forsaken is actually three Greek words put together to make one. Lipo is the verb which means to leave. It's prefaced by the preposition kata, which means down. And these two words are prefixed by the other preposition ek, meaning out of. Down, leave, down, out of. My God, my God, why have you left me down and out? That's what Jesus asked with this Aramaic terminology. He felt as though God had left him down and out. I want you to remember Hebrews 13 verse 5 says, The Lord Himself has said, I will in no wise fail you, literally desert you. Neither will I in any wise ekatalipo, forsake you. The Lord Himself has said, I will not desert you, nor will I leave you down and out. But He felt left down and out. In Hebrews 13 verse 5, the Lord says, I'm not going to desert you, and I'm not going to do to you what God did to me. Jesus, He hangs there, and He feels abandoned. Now ask your Self. Why? Let me suggest secondly, as we turn to Psalms 22, that David wrote this psalm feeling as though he was a man ashamed. Verses 3 through 6. And in verses 3 through 6, we find three declarations of a man who feels shamed, ashamed. There's a declaration about His heavenly Father. There's a declaration about His earthly fathers. And then there is a declaration about Himself. Declaration number one, David says of his heavenly Father, but you are holy. Truer words could have never been penned. Be ye holy, even as he who called you is holy. For it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. You'll read that in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. And it will take you back to Leviticus chapter 11, where God says, I expect you to live a life separated from the world, because I am transcended and separated from the world myself. You be holy because I am holy. In Revelation chapter 4, the four living creatures, symbolic of the entire angelic host, were heard singing night and day, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. And this, in this psalm, David recognizes God as the Holy One. You're holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. It reminds me of what I find in Psalms 145, verse 3. Great is our Lord, greatly to be praised. That's the sentiment of David's words here. Dear God, you are transcendent. You are holy, and you are so praiseworthy. That's his declaration about God. And now a declaration is made about not his heavenly father, but his earthly fathers. Watch what he says about them. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not ashamed. He said it three times. They trusted in you. And he said it three times. They were delivered. They were delivered. They were not ashamed. They weren't left literally pale from embarrassment. But the implication that David is writing is, I've trusted in you. You haven't delivered me. I've trusted in you. And you haven't delivered me. I have trusted in you. You have left me 
ashamed. And so a third declaration is made, this one about himself. His heavenly Father, holy, praiseworthy. His earthly fathers, trusted in God, were delivered. What about himself? David said, but I am a worm. We could literally translate the Hebrew term, I am a maggot and no man. A reproach of men. and despised by the people. Of his heavenly father, David said, David declared, you're holy. Of his earthly fathers, David declared, they were helped. Of himself, David declared, I'm absolutely hopeless. He felt like a man ashamed. Well, now let's take pause a moment. As Jesus hung from the cross, did he feel ashamed? Could I remind you of what we find in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3? There it tells us that Jesus endured the cross. Hupomeno. Menno to remain, hoop a wonder. He remained under the pressure of the cross. Watch it. Despising shame. Despising. Kata no eo. No eo to think, kata down. He remained under the pressure of the cross, thinking down on the shame. He utterly despised every barbed word that was thrown in his direction. And he felt the shame of a man who endured the cruelty of his fellow man. He felt the shame of a man who had to experience the nudity caused by his fellow man. That's right. In John chapter 19, I read about four soldiers who divided his garments. Now pause for a minute. You see, in Jesus' day, a mature Jewish male would wear five pieces of clothing. There would be a right sandal, a left sandal. There would be a loincloth or undergarment. There would be an outer garment, a cloak. And then there would be a girdle that would bind the outer garment around the man's midriff. And so when he would want to run or walk, he would reach down to his outer garment, pull up the hem, stuff it inside his girdle, and he would walk unencumbered. Right sandal, left sandal, loincloth, outer cloak, and girdle. Five pieces of clothing. There are four soldiers that saw to or tended to the crucifixion of Jesus, John 19 tells me. And they divided his clothing among them each having a part. But the cloak was seamless. They gambled it away. So on this occasion, one soldier went home with a right sandal. One went home with a left sandal. One went home with the Lord's loincloth. One went home with the Lord's girdle. And one of those also went home with the Lord's outer garment or cloak, leaving our Lord Jesus with the shame of wearing absolutely nothing. And he despised every moment he was thus exposed. Yes, he felt ashamed. Wouldn't you? But now, ask yourself why? Let me suggest in the third place tonight, as we read Psalms 22, David wrote this psalm feeling as a man who was truly alone. Verses 7 through 11. 
As we read verses 7 through 11, David expresses the feeling of a man that had gone through no less but three rejections. Rejected by his friends and citizens, rejected by his family, and rejected by his Father in heaven. He felt rejected and alone. Verse 7. Rejected by his friends and countrymen. All those who see me ridicule me. Literally, they laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. Literally, they stretch the mouth with derision. If you please, they laugh me to scorn and make faces at me. They shake the head and say... He trusted in the Lord. Let Him rescue him. Let Him deliver him. Sound familiar? Stand in the shadows of Calvary. That's exactly what the enemies of Jesus said about Him. And so David felt alone, rejected by his friends and countrymen. As I read verses 9 and 10, repeated references made to his family. But you are he, God, David writes to, um, to God, but you are he who took me out of the womb. You are my mother's G-Y-N. You made me trust while I'm on my brother's breast. You were my pediatrician. I was cast upon you from birth from my mother's womb. You have been my God. You've been my Bible school teacher. Now watch how many references are made to his mother in that passage. He writes about his mother's womb in verse 9. He writes about his mother's breast in verse 9. He writes once again about his mother's womb in verse 10. But where is she? I could go back to 1 Samuel. And I could read in chapter 17 how that David's mother and daddy were very old when he was born. They were here no more. And where were his brothers? And where is the reference to them? And so he says in verse 11, Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. He's alone. His friends have abandoned him. His family has abandoned him. His mother's no longer there to give him comfort, as mothers do. And he's pleading for God's help. Don't be far from me, but hold on. Go back to verse 1, and that's exactly how he felt. Why are you so far from me? And so here is a man alone, without a friend, without a family member, and he felt as though without his Father in heaven. Take pause. Did Jesus feel alone? As he hung on the cross. In Matthew 26 verse 31. Before his ordeal in Gethsemane. At Gabbatha. And at Golgotha. Jesus made the prediction. Quoting Old Testament scripture. All you will stumble because of me. This night. And he was abandoned by them all with but a handful. If you'll carefully read John 19, you'll find there was standing literally near the cross his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, Mary Magdalene, and the apostle whom he loved. And that was the occasion that his eyes locked onto those of his mother. And he said, Woman, 
Behold your son. Now I'm inclined to believe that in those words John was trying or Jesus was trying to direct attention of Mary from himself in his death to his best friend John. Because he goes on to say, Behold your mother. But I can't help for a moment to just think, could Jesus have meant Mama, look what they've done to your boy. Could it be that for a moment, even though she understood what he was saying, Mary might have thought that? And then he probably experienced one of the greatest pains of the entire six-hour ordeal when he watches his best friend John and his mother Mary Turn around, walk away. Perhaps John's arms around Mary's shoulder where he wished so desperately his could be. And he's more alone than any man has ever been before or since. Abandoned by his friends, alone with no family, and left down and out, forsaken by his God. Now, ask yourself why. Why? Last of all, as we read Psalms 22, I read from the Words of David, a man who felt afflicted. Verses 12 through 21. And in verses 12 through 21, David directs our reading to three different directions. First of all, he looks around. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. Drop down to verse 16. Dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. Verse 21. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild oxen. Individuals that were so violent and so cruel. He describes them as bulls and lions and dogs and wild oxen. And he says, they have surrounded me. They have encircled me. They have enclosed me. David felt like a man who everywhere he looked was surrounded by ravaging beasts that were held back, muzzled, if you please, by his enemies. And those wild beasts are just leaping, fangs showing, desiring to make him their prey. And his enemies are holding them back, just ready for the right time to let them go and let them pounce and let them make prey. And that's how David felt on this occasion. Surrounded by his enemies. How did that make him feel? Well, the second direction that David looks, he looks within. Verse 14. I'm poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. Now that's how he felt. That's how he symbolically expressed himself. Can you imagine how Jesus must have literally felt via the cruelty of Calvary? My heart is like wax. That is, it has melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue clings to my jaws. I thirst. You have brought me to the dust of death. He literally felt like someone who had already died. 
died. Is this what death feels like? The dust of death. Poured out. Melted within. Dried up. Is this what death feels like? So he looked around. He looked within. And then he looked up. Verse 19. But you, O Lord, do not be far from me. Same song, second verse. He said it three times now. O oh, my strength, hasten to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life, from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild oxen. Why are you so far from helping me? Verse 1. Be not far from me, trouble is near, verse 11. But you, O Lord, do not be far from me, verse 19. They're surrounding me. I can taste death, it's here. Dear God, give me your help. Don't be far from me. He felt like a man afflicted by the plight of his circumstance. Take pause. Did Jesus feel afflicted? As he experienced the pangs of Golgotha, usually every Sunday morning when I partake of the Lord's Supper, I like to turn to Matthew 27 where I have underlined some words, each of which start with the letter S to remind me of the body of Jesus and all that it went through For this thing called Calvary. Matthew 27, verse 26. Then he released Barabbas, Pilate did, to them. And when he had underlined it, scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. It's called the little death. Where an individual is literally Flayed alive. Bringing such excruciating agony, some of the victims that went through scourging would bite off their tongues in an effort to endure the process. The Jews had a rule, 40 stripes save one. They could only whip someone 39 times. The Romans had no law. Their limitation was he must still be alive for the execution. Whip him as long as you wish, but deliver him alive. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him. And they underline it, stripped him. And put a scarlet robe on him. Can you imagine the agony of having your clothes taken off of a back that has literally been turned into confetti? Only for another piece of clothing to be placed there? Think about the blood and the plasma that had made its way into the material of the garments. And I wonder if, it, if enough time had transpired to where some of the garment had begun to literally dry and adhere to the wounds. And in taking the garment of Jesus off and putting another one on and then going through the process again, did the wounds, well, were they reopened and bleed even more profusely? When they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hey, O king of the Jews. And they underline it, spat on him. Can you think of anything more disgusting than the mucus from the mouth of another human being being hurled into your direction, into your eyes, onto your face, onto your shoulders, onto the wounds of your back, the back of your neck, the back of your legs, the back of your arms. 
And they took the reed and they underlined it, struck him on the head. As if the wounds he had already experienced weren't enough, now they take this mock scepter and they whip him over the head and beat that mock crown, if you please, even deeper into his skull. And when they had mocked him and took the robe off him, put his own clothes on him, they led him away to be crucified. Now as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, him they compelled to bear his cross. When they'd come to the place called Golgotha, that is to say, place of a skull, underline skull, it's called Golgotha in Matthew, Mark, and John, place of the skull, Hebrew. It's called the place of the cranion in the book of Luke. Luke being the physician, he uses the word for cranium, skull. They crucified him in a place known for executions that literally reeked with the stench of death. And they gave him sour wine, underlined sour wine, mingled with gall to drink, but when he had tasted it, he would not drink. They crucified him. Divided his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. And hear the words from Psalms 22 we read earlier. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Sitting down, they kept watch over him there. And they put over his head the accusation written against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. That's not an accusation. That's a declaration. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right hand, another on the left. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, underline, saying, You who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. They laughed at his might. If you're the Son of God, come down from the cross. They laughed at his Messiahship. Likewise, the chief priest also, mocking what the scribes and elders said, underline said, He saved others. Let him save himself. He cannot save himself. They laughed at his mission. If he's the king of Israel, let him come down from the cross and we'll believe him. They laughed at his majesty. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. They laughed at his mind. For he said, I am the son of God. They laughed at his message. They laughed at his might. They laughed at his messiahship. They laughed at his mission. They laughed at his majesty. They laughed at his mind. They laughed at his message. And even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled on him with the same. You reckon Jesus felt like a man afflicted? Now, ask yourself why? And you and I need to ask that question because Jesus himself dared to ask it. From the sixth hour, verse 45 goes on, that's 12 o'clock noon, until the ninth hour, that's 3 o'clock in the afternoon, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Jesus cried with a megaphone, megaphone, loud voice, megaphone, megaphone. It's like he held up a megaphone and began to shout with his voice echoing across the proud landscape of this place of the skull, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why? And in the margin of my Bible, I'm ashamed to say I've written the answer. I am the reason why. That's why, like John, Jesus felt abandoned and ashamed and alone and afflicted. I am the reason why. As we close, let's bring this thought into your life and mine with something the Holy Spirit wants me to remember. In Titus chapter 2, 14, 
The Holy Spirit through Paul says this. He, Jesus, gave himself that he might redeem us from away from all iniquity and purify for himself a people zealous of good works. Titus 2.14 tells me, because of what Jesus did, I can be separated ah, from my sins. And that's forgiveness. Redeemed from all iniquity. But Titus 2.14 also says, because of what Jesus did, I can be separated from sin and separated for Jesus. He did that to redeem me from all iniquity and purify me, purify for Himself a people for His own possession, zealous of good works. I can belong to Jesus tonight. I don't have to belong to my past. And what He experienced makes that possible. How about an amen? Is that worth a hallelujah? To be followed up by a what? Praise God. Why was he silent when a word would slay his accusers all? Why does he meekly bear their taunts when angels wait his call? He was made sin. My sin he bore upon the accursed tree. And sin hath no defense to make. His silence was for me. Uh, this is the man who said before he left this earth, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. You can argue with him until the sun doesn't shine if you wish. But a man who experienced everything that he experienced for me, when he tells me he wants me to believe in him as God's son, I just think I'm going to do that. And when he tells me that he wants me to be baptized, to be saved from my past, I'm not going to argue with that. That's little. That is little to hint for him to ask me to do in contrast to everything that he was willing to do. And so tonight, if you believe with all of your heart that Jesus is the Son of God, you can be baptized and know the salvation that His death has made possible. Let us help you in doing that. Think about all He experienced just for you and respond to the invitation tonight that is for you as we stand together and as we sing.
like to personally invite everybody to come back again tomorrow night, the last evening of our meeting. And if you know of a friend that you would love to be here with you, please give him or her a call. Our lesson tomorrow night is entitled, The Permission to Enjoy the Remission of Sins. Just exactly who is forgiven? That's a great question. Hey, here's another one. Am I, are you forgiven? Do I, do you enjoy this wonderful blessing that God has made possible through Jesus? Well, think about that tomorrow night. The permission to enjoy the remission of sin. Thank you again, Brother Dan. What a wonderful treat. What a wonderful blessing it has been to be here tonight to study God's Word. I just sit there and I think, isn't this stuff great? <laughs> isn't this wonderful, this wonderful book? And um, Dan, you just have a wonderful gift in imparting the Word of God. Thank you so much. And thank you for uh, spending this time with us. As he mentioned, one more night. And uh, I, uh, I know we'll have a good crowd here. I know that some of our visiting congregations will have to be back with their own congregations. But I want to remind you again that these, um, these lessons are being streamed online. We have several uh, that are watching it from home that can't be here tonight. These are also, we'll go into uh, our recorded process. And so that you can go to our website, beaufordcoc.com, and scroll down the bottom of the page. And you can go back and watch any of the recordings that we've uh, kept in this meeting will certainly be, uh, be kept. So uh, do take advantage of those, these other lessons, just some of the greatest lessons I've, I've ever heard on the cross, on forgiveness, on relationships. Just truly, truly powerful. I hope you'll go back. Again, we want to thank everyone for coming and being with us. Uh, so many congregations represented. We appreciate you coming and being here. I see we have a good consortium from Ella J around. We're just glad to have you folks come and be with us. They got a new preacher, Jeremy Green. I'm going to ask Jeremy, if you will, to come and lead us in a word of prayer after we sing this, uh, this last song. And uh, again, thank you for being here. Be safe in your travel, especially over the hills, you Ella J folks, as you make your way home. But God bless you. Final song tonight is number 653, The Way of the Cross. 653, we'll sing the first few verses and then be led in our closing prayer. I must needs go along by the way of the cross. There's no other way but this. I shall say. so much for this night, for this opportunity to be here, to hear a fine message from your word, and tonight especially to be humble, to think about the fact that we are the reason that 
your son had to endure the pain and the shame and the affliction and the burden of the cross. Help us in our lives, Father, when we feel that we're somehow righteous or we feel that we somehow deserve something to understand the brutality of the sacrifice and most importantly the power of that sacrifice and the innocence of, of your son's life and the fact that it had to be that innocence that saved us from our iniquities. And help us whenever we feel that we're better than we are to understand that. And Father, we thank you so much when we look around tonight for the congregations that are represented. We thank you for the work that's done here in Buford for Brother Scott and for the leadership and all that's done. And help us all as we travel back home tonight to be safe, but to take something that we've learned and to try and enrich our congregations and to just help them to understand the seriousness and the gravity of the message that was delivered. And Father, in that humility, we also have thanksgiving and, and praise and rejoicing. We also have eternal life waiting on us. Help us as we go through this world, no matter how difficult it becomes to understand that that home is waiting for us and there's a day when we'll leave it all behind and we'll be able to, because of the sacrifice of your son, be with you forever. Father, be with those that are struggling tonight. Be with those who are spiritually sick, who are physically ill, who are going through the storms of life that inevitably come our way. Give them comfort and give them peace and the understanding that we have that great reward waiting for us. Once again, Father, be with us as we separate. Continue to bless this meeting as it concludes tomorrow and help us all to serve you with every fiber of our being as long as we're on this earth. And it's through Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.